Hi and welcome to today's episode. Thank you so much for joining this week's Live Healthy Now podcast episode. Today I have a fantastic guest with me. This is a conversation that I've wanted to have on the podcast for quite some time and I did start the conversation with the solo episode which was number 46 where I talked about why you never need to go on a diet again. So today I have with me expert nutritional therapist Louise Digby and we're going to dive much deeper into the topic of weight loss and the role that food plays in managing your weight and creating strong health. So welcome to the podcast Louise. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's brilliant to have you here. And as I said, this is such an important topic to explore. And it's one that I've been very cautious of, actually, as a health coach to to talk about specifically in the context of weight loss, because I know how sensitive it is and how difficult it is and how much noise there is out there on weight loss dieting, what to eat and so on. So yeah, it's it's really good to have you here to explore more of this. But before we do get started with this specific topic, I just would like to ask you what your most impactful habit is that you have in your wellness toolkit. Um, Oh, good question. I think the most impactful habit is having a consistent wake time and bedtime I find for me, if I can be consistent with getting up the same time every day and trying to get to bed roughly the same time every evening, I just feel so much better in myself. And when things get busy, I often lose that habit. And I just notice such a difference in my energy levels and productivity and mood. So yeah, a, a regular wake time and sleep time is really big for me. Oh, brilliant. And a key thing with that is the wake time you mentioned, because one of the pillars I focus on is sleep. And what a lot of people do when they're trying to improve their sleep and have better energy the following day is focus just on the bedtime piece. But the morning wake up time and routine is actually more important in many ways than what you do directly before going to bed. So that's brilliant that you've found that and built that habit in for yourself and I think yeah it's something that that you know because of how we work physiologically with all of the different body clocks we have going on in our system it's it's really one of the key things to try to do because for many people that Monday to Friday period can be completely different to the Saturday Sunday and then you go back to work Monday and you feel pretty rubbish because you've just thrown those routines out of the window it's a great great advice Mm -hmm. and tip there yeah (laughs) so I think maybe a good place to start would be with the word diet as I said I did a solo episode talking about why you never need to go on a diet again because that's a term for many people and I've read stats about how many years on average women spend dieting it's just such a massive part of of our kind of life and way of living, isn't it? So what's like your take on that word diet and how does it fit into the work that you do? Mm. Yeah, we, we tend to assume the word diet with restriction, right? And we tend to mm. think of it as something that you do as like a temporary thing to try and get some weight off. But the reality is diet is, it just means what you eat and that means many different things to to different people. And what you eat should be a really positive thing. So I'm not a big fan of the way that the word diet is used uh, because it generally has negative connotations. But I think you do have to be really careful with the way that you talk about food or the way that you talk about changing your diet because I think a lot of people hear that word diet and then instantly either switch off or think that, oh, you know, this is just to help me lose weight. But actually, you might be talking about a diet to help your gut health or to help your sleep or something else entirely. So, yeah, the word diet and weight seem to be intrinsically linked, but actually mm. they're not at all. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And it's something that when you work in this 
industry and sector you then have to be careful about the wording of don't you mm. because as you said when you use the word diet somebody a lot of people probably go to that place of restriction denial weight loss and so on and and something I've tried to do is educate people that we all have a diet that's why you don't go on a diet you may mm. change your diet but my daughter for example has celiac disease you know so her diet has to be a diet that eliminates wheat barley and rye and protects her from gluten so you know she's mm -hmm. got a diet like we all have a diet like your pets have a diet you know every, every living creature has to have a diet it's just what you choose to make your diet and how that works for you isn't it but you're right there's so so many really deep beliefs especially as women that we've inherited and been conditioned with about mm. you know diet and being something that means temporary it's restriction it's denial and so on and and so is that something you try to help when you work with women mainly over 40 you know that perimenopause menopause stage of life do you find that's something that you really have to work with them from a mindset point of view on to shift their understanding of definitely I find that um for for most women that come to see me they tend to be not in a good place when it comes to their relationship with food and food is often the enemy it's something that is like a barrier to their to their goals when actually mm -hmm. it's it's the other way around you know that the food is is the thing that is going to be able to heal and repair their body and so we do a lot of work on really just changing how people perceive food and rather than seeing it as like food being fattening or slimming or good or bad instead looking at food as being really valuable and the nutritional value of foods and it being something that is basically like medicine and you know able to cause significant change in the body but not through restricting it by actually eating more of it in most cases um you know for a lot of the women that I work with we actually get them eating more because they are they've been depriving themselves for so mm -hmm. long and that impacts their metabolism makes their metabolism slow down and if you want your metabolism to be functioning properly you've got to provide it with enough fuel you've got to provide your thyroid with enough fuel your brain with enough fuel in order to be able to have balanced hormones and a metabolism that's actually working efficiently mm. and one of the things that surprised me when I started to coach clients was the reality of what some people's diets were really like and the beliefs they had around what they were doing to try to achieve their health goals, which often are, you know, managing weight or losing weight and being a specific weight and looking a certain way and thinking, well, you know, if I stick to only eating this amount of food, then I have to lose weight because quantity wise, it's not much and not everyone was necessarily counting calories but they were just looking at the quantity and volume and ignoring the quality aspect and as you said there mm -hmm. food is fuel in so many ways and and one of the shifts that happened for me in my story because I struggled with my weight well I made myself struggle with it basically from being about 12 13 years old and lived you know a life throughout adulthood of yo-yo dieting and binge eating and emotional eating and, and so on but a big shift for me was realizing the role that food plays in so much more than the weight loss or the weight that you are and so that's really important isn't it and I know I love that you focus on on that and you've mentioned that there because we need to help people shift from the calories in calories out way of thinking and 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 you know what I've seen with with clients and, and people I know and myself included in this is you create a diet that you think is going to give you those results you want on the scales and then you just want to revert back to what you think is like normal do you know and and that it's it's about a, a temporary thing rather than a way of life and understanding that role that food plays so how important is is that piece of knowing what what food does much more than managing weight yeah i think it's really important to have that 
understanding that kind of foundational knowledge about how food actually works in your body and that's something that I spend a fair bit of time with my clients doing because it's all well and good telling them okay you need to eat this and that but if you don't understand why you're doing it then as soon as you hit a snag in the road most people just revert to default and unfortunately for most women the default is restriction and you know it's it's just like the natural thing to do almost. And, you know, I've found myself doing it at times where you think, oh, you know, I'll I'll just have smaller portions tonight or, you know, over the next week or so. And then you think, hang on a minute, (laughs) that's not how it works. We don't need to be just cutting back. We don't need to be restricting the amount of food we're having. We need to be focusing on the quality of the food. And instead of thinking, oh, I, you know, I need to, have fewer calories, fewer points, fewer sins or whatever. Instead, we need to be thinking about what our body needs. And when we are just looking at the amount of food, we are completely overlooking the quality of the food. And in most cases, when you're opting to restrict, you're usually missing out on essential nutrients. And if we don't have enough of protein, let's say, then we're going to start losing muscle and that is going to make your metabolism slow down and that is going to make you gain weight in the long term. And if you don't have enough carbs, then your thyroid isn't going to be fueled properly. Your thyroid is the master controller of your metabolism. So that will cause your metabolism to slow down as well. And we need fats so that we can make our hormones. So if we're restricting any one of those main food groups too much, then we're setting ourselves up for weight gain in the long run. You might lose weight initially, but the weight will start to go back on. And that's the experience that so many women have when they do a restrictive diet. Mm. And I think what's really frightening is that for many women, when you reach this midlife point, you know, we have spent years misunderstanding the role of food and what a diet is and and everything we're talking about here with the role that food plays in strong health and well-being and then things start to change hormonally and it's very confusing isn't it even for me having learned what I've learned it's still really confusing and I know there's still so much research taking place and a lot of it's very new progressive research Mm -hmm. so there's a lot more I think over the next few years definitely the next 10 to 15 years I think will really help to provide very clear guidance and understanding but for us women in this 40 kind of um 40 to 50 plus period of our lives where we've had all of those previous years of not having this knowledge like how do we start to shift this because we can come on to the hormonal changes of perimenopause and menopause and what they mean but you know things do start to change and so suddenly you think well hang on I'm eating the same food but I'm not feeling the same or looking the same either but we don't have that knowledge do we and and so that's that's a real challenge. Mm, I think what a lot of women find is that the diets and the weight loss methods that used to work for them when they were in their 20s and 30s stop working when they're in their 40s and beyond. And a big reason for that is because of how your body changes as you go through that perimenopause or menopausal transition. And what your body needs is not less fuel what it needs is support in in making hormones efficiently eliminating them properly we need to be very conscious of things that can be inflammatory because you're going to be much more prone to inflammation we also need to think about things like toxic load because around this time you're again much more sensitive to the impacts of toxins in your environment so you know that can be things like pollution or the fragrances in your home and in candles and perfumes things in skincare products um cleaning products all these sorts of things that we're all exposed to all the time um are things that can interfere with how you actually detox your hormones from your body um so being 
conscious of the various different things that can interfere with your hormones and therefore your weight management is really the first step because forever we've just worked on our health and our weight by just restricting Mm -hmm. and actually there's so much more to it than just what you eat and how much you exercise you know and you mentioned earlier about sleep that's a massive factor as well that gets really overlooked so it's about looking at pretty much every area of our our lives our lifestyles to achieve optimal health and you know that's what I find for my clients you know we get the best results when we're focusing on optimizing health as opposed to just trying to get the weight off Mm. it's just such a shift isn't it from what most people know and I certainly can hear it in my group of friends that this understanding just isn't there it's not mainstream you know if people are looking for solutions and they find you and and learn more about what you do or or myself or you know the coaches then yeah you can start to to learn this but it's such a lot it it feels a lot even for me it feels a lot you know when you talk about Mm. the toxins that's something I'm aware of and I think my message and kind of one of the principles I use when I work with clients is not everyone can do it all it's really hard you know it's about prioritizing for you what you think will make the biggest difference but having that awareness is the starting point and the key isn't it to to then think okay actually maybe you know if if I'm just focusing and using so much energy on what I eat but I'm missing all of these other bits then that effort may not be as valuable as it could be I'm sure it's adding value from a nutritional perspective but probably not contributing as much as it should to your overall goals that you have Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah and I I think that even just becoming knowledgeable about these things and reading up on them and listening to podcasts uh, that will help you to just naturally make changes because once you know once you know how certain things impact you you'll naturally want to choose alternatives um, and I think a good example is I'm, I'm reading a really good book at the moment, um, which is called Ultra Processed People. And um, it's it's all about ultra processed foods. And it's it's very interesting. Um, but what the author says in the beginning is don't just cut out processed foods. Just listen to this book and kind of see how things go. And as you start reading it, you just start thinking, okay, well, I really don't want to buy that anymore because I know what's in it now. and I know how that impacts my body. And actually what used to be tasty now doesn't sound very tasty at all because I know what's in it. So I think just getting knowledgeable is is a really healthy way to approach any change, whether it's to lose weight or whether it's to address your gut health or whatever. Um, Because what as we were saying before, once you understand what's going on, you're more likely to sustain those changes, but also they're going to be coming from a place of you wanting to to better your health as opposed to just temporarily change your diet to get some weight off. Absolutely. I, I think I know who wrote that book. It, it's the British doctor, as he called Chris, is it? I can't remember his name. He's one of the twins. I can't from, remember. Yeah. Yes. I've heard. Yeah, I've heard him um, recently on a podcast actually talking about writing the book, and he's great. He's, he's if anyone's interested in knowing who it is, reach out. He's done quite a few programs for the BBC, and and yeah, yeah. he's extremely knowledgeable. And that that was something for me that was a big shift. On as I say, was, was moving to that realization of the quality of what I eat and I think I heard somebody literally yesterday actually on a podcast talking about this another doctor and he said you know there's a reality we live in 2024 when this episode said our world is literally pushing so much onto us that isn't going to contribute to good health there's Mm -hmm. a reality to this commercialized world we live in especially when it comes to food and you know, our lives are very fast paced and, and we're designed as humans to survive. And so we want the easy option and convenience when it comes to food is right there in front of us all of the time. 
So this isn't about having to be perfect, but as you said, it's about having the knowledge to make informed decisions. So for yeah. example, if I if I choose to get a takeaway, which I, I don't do very often, I'm just not one of those type of people, probably because I understand about food and I, I know how it makes me feel. But I would do that from a place of knowledge and I would choose something that's, you know, probably middle of the road rather than maybe at the, the bottom of the road, so to mm. speak. But I know what that's doing. And that's an informed choice rather than just living that way and eating that way regularly without the understanding that we're mm-hmm. trying to share. And so I think that's the key point is to have, as you say, with, with his book, it's very good at just giving you that information and then you choose what to do. So one of the big things for me that I've tried to shift in the past year or two has been to reduce as many fake foods as possible from my diet, you know, things that Mm. are not whole food, you know, those added ingredients that we don't need. So I have a very sweet tooth, but we bake a lot at home, especially because my daughter has celiac disease. But I know what's going into that. You know, it's not, yeah. it doesn't have those emulsifiers and modifiers and preservatives and chemicals and artificial sweeteners and, and things that those pre-made, very highly, you know, ultra-processed foods are, are made to um, contain and, and you know, addict us to, essentially, which is probably a whole other conversation. Um, but so, yeah, yeah it certainly on. is. I was going to say, um, you know, these these foods these ultra processed foods aren't really foods you know they've been taken from what was once a food and yeah. bleached and deodorized and you know god knows what else done to it to um turn them into this thing that is basically you know flavorless so that you can add it into any food and it does whatever job it needs to do whether that's to thicken it or change the texture or preserve it um, but they've been so heavily processed that by the time we're eating them, they're really not food anymore. They're not anything resembling a natural product. And so our our bodies don't recognize them. We don't really know what impact they're having on our bodies in the long term. Um, and also they don't they don't fill us up and they are addictive and we do end up eating so much of them. Um, I mean, I'm fairly early in the book at the moment, but he was talking about how his uh, daughter was eating Cocoa Pops, which is something she doesn't normally have. And she was just eating and eating and eating them because it's not food. You know, it isn't registering in the brain as something that's actually filling and meeting her nutritional needs. Um, Whereas normally she has porridge and, you know, she has her small serving and is fine and, you know, has kind of like normal healthy behaviors whereas apparently she was really angry and irritable after she'd had these cocoa pops and it just goes to show that even just one meal is is enough to throw you off balance and impact your kind of finely tuned mechanisms in your body and when it comes to weight loss this is part of what you're trying to help people understand isn't it because yes that that bowl of cocoa pops for example you've mentioned there you could have a bowl of that which might have the same calories as a bowl of porridge or a bowl of Greek yogurt with some fruit and some honey and nuts on or something. But what that bowl of cocoa pops does when you are then metabolizing that is very different to the impact of those other choices. And, mm-hmm. and that's what can then disrupt the gut your hormones, so many other things, which all then play a part in the process that happens to manage your weight. And I think that's that's what we're trying to help people understand, isn't that weight isn't about eating the right volume of food. It's about what that food is doing to make you, I always say you are a machine and use mm-hmm. the comparison to a car. You know, everything that goes in does a job and has a role to play. And so if you are feeding yourself with a lot of highly processed foods that aren't contributing to the production of hormones and good gut health and so on, then that's why it can impact everything, not just your weight, like your sleep, your stress, your overall happiness. There's just so much, isn't there? So something I wanted to, to get your 
advice on and, and, and a topic I'm really starting to learn more about and love mm-hmm. is the gut health because this mm-hmm. does play a massive role and a huge role which we're only right at the beginning of understanding when it comes to menopause. Mm. Yeah, so the gut is is just so central to your health and it is involved in pretty much everything that's going on in your body. So, sorry, my dog's doing some little words. <laughs> um, shush, shush. Um, so, yeah, your your gut is involved in, in so many things. And if there are imbalances in your gut, which could be to do with the balance of the bacteria or the yeast or how well you're digesting and absorbing your food, then that is going to have a knock-on effect on everything, your skin, your sleep, your mood, your joint health, your anxiety, um, you know, pretty much anything whatever it is, it's linked to the gut in some way because it's that's where we receive our food and we process it and absorb it. And it's also where we eliminate as well. You know, the liver does the detoxification, but we eliminate via the gut. So if the gut isn't happy, if it's not working properly, then the impact is felt throughout the body in many, many different ways. And I run tests on pretty much all my clients to investigate their gut health. And we find that there are imbalances in the gut for pretty much everyone that we work with. Um, and you know, a lot of them don't have obvious symptoms, you no know, bloating or, or constipation, diarrhea, obvious gut symptoms, but they have other things going on, which could be eczema or almost all of them, stubborn weight. Um, and it's only when we really get the gut working properly and properly balanced that we tend to see the real transformation in health and well-being so yeah it's it's massive and it's something that we should all be thinking about is making sure that our guts are healthy yeah absolutely i say i'm I'm really enjoying learning a lot more about this and that's kind of what i think about when i'm making food choices is what is this going to do to my gut and a big shift that i I mean, I, I always ate a lot of vegetables and, and plant food, you know, not just veg as such. But this year I really started to track how many different plants I was having across a week with that target of 30. And I was amazed mm. at how easy it was to quite quickly in the week achieve that 30. And I've loved doing that. I've loved introducing new fruit, vegetables, nuts, things, you know, pulses, things that I know are going to help my gut microbiome to thrive um mm. and it's some it's something I've struggled with because I did start to have some gut issues in the summer um and I've been using Simprove which is one of the the prebiotics to try mm-hmm. to help with that and I, th- I think it has helped but I know you know it's predominantly from the natural foods that you eat that you build that healthy gut yeah. so yeah what what would you suggest to someone listening who maybe hasn't really heard much about this and, and doesn't know the role it plays. Like to get started with trying to improve gut health and, and coming at, you know, like a change in their diet from that perspective mm. and maybe putting the weight loss goal to one side and just thinking about improving yeah. that, that gut health. Yeah, I think the main thing for gut health is like you were saying, is variety. And that goal of 30 different plants per week is is a really achievable one I think if you're not thinking about it if you're not really thinking about getting the variety in, into your diet it's very easy to fall into you know having only a few different plants because when you look at a lot of people's diets they might have um let's say Weetabix for breakfast a sandwich for lunch and some pasta for dinner well they're all the same plant which is wheat so for a lot of people, wheat is the predominant thing in the diet. You might feel like you're getting some variety, but there isn't a huge amount there. But actually, if we can start thinking about varying the grains a little bit, varying the different vegetables that you have from day to day, trying to get a variety of nuts and seeds in, herbs and spices, they all count as plants, beans and lentils, Um once you start thinking about all those different things and just making a little bit of effort to get some variety and it's quite easy to hit that 30 different plants goal and 
doing that provides your gut with a, a huge variety of fiber and fiber is what feeds our bacteria in the gut and that's a really good thing because we need to keep our gut bacteria well fueled and having a variety of fibers comes in coming in ensures that the, there's a variety of different species of bacteria in the gut that are all thriving so that's the problem when we we don't have enough variety in the diet is that we end up with a a very poor diversity in the gut of bacteria and that can lead to inflammation it can lead to food intolerances it can slow down your gut transit which can kind of lead up to you reabsorbing some of the stuff you're supposed to be eliminating like hormones and toxins so it has a, a whole knock-on effect but definitely aiming for variety is the first place to start mm, brilliant advice and and you know talking about that role of the gut with elimination as well and the part it plays with hormones to come back to that perimenopause menopause stage this is why so many women often have for the first time in their life a weight problem you know as such you know like there's a lot of women who'll say oh I've, I've never struggled with my weight and they've probably therefore eaten whatever food they wanted as part of their diet but as those <clears throat> hormones start to change and again it's very new science but we're starting to realize that there's a role the gut plays in menopause and also that those hormonal changes are impacting the gut and, and so on so it's just all so connected isn't it and and that means it's 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 so much more important to think about it in this way because that's often that root you know underneath right at the very root of of what's behind potentially struggling with gaining weight and losing weight isn't it mm, definitely and I also think that a lot of people tend to try and take the shortcut when they are trying to address some of these things because it's you know the easy thing to do is to go and buy a probiotic or a prebiotic and if you're not putting the right fuel into your body that's going to have a very temporary benefit that probiotic or prebiotic a lot of people end up taking them really long term for years because they feel like whenever they stop taking them their symptoms come back or things go backwards but the likelihood is, is that they haven't changed their diet in a way that's actually going to sustain a healthy gut environment. Um, and, you know, you'll get far more benefits from making a few tweaks to your diet than putting in a supplement. Um, you know, mm -hmm. particularly if you're just putting in the supplement and not making those dietary and lifestyle changes. Mm. And, and one of the questions I, I want to ask, because I know this is a myth, but I want to hear how you explain it. A lot of women reach this menopausal phase of life and say, oh, well, that's it now. I'm never going to lose the weight. You know, I, I honestly believed until probably the last couple of years that it was inevitable to gain weight at that stage of life. And that's just how it was, especially if you take HRT. So... It is normal to gain a little bit of weight around that time because when you when your ovaries start to shut down and basically what happens is you you stop producing hormones from your ovaries and your adrenal glands start to take over the production of some of the sex hormones um, and your adrenal gland, glands only kind of compensate so much particularly if you're under stress so having a little bit of extra fat is actually a good thing because your fat tissue produces some estrogen. So it helps to maintain that hormone balance to a certain extent. Now that doesn't mean that gaining loads of weight is, is the norm, but just being a little bit bigger than you were in your twenties is normal. And aiming to be the size and weight that you were in your twenties is generally not achievable. So I think it's important to acknowledge that um, but you know, I've worked with a lot of women who have kind of felt the same way as you in that they really, you know, felt that that was it once they, once they got into their forties and fifties and that weight had gone on because, you know, partly because it's what we're told, but also because they'd really tried everything and the weight wasn't coming off. 
Um, but I have seen that turn around for so many women. So it's, it's so not true. Um, but I, I think that what we believe really will determine what our behaviors are. And if we don't believe that it's possible for us to, to lose weight or achieve whatever goal, then our behaviors will align with that. And we, we won't be making the steps or taking the actions consistently to actually get, get us to our goals, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I I literally love that. What you said there, that is so true. We have to believe that. And, and this, I think we're at this point, aren't we, where there is this shift happening around menopause, especially, and and, and with that, hopefully more on women's health and, and more understanding in that everything we've known is pretty much wrong. Do you know what we think about menopause and it being the beginning of the end and that you have to put on weight and you're getting old and, you know, you have to start to change and your life probably gets quite different and boring and you're restricted. I, that isn't the case we we know that now and we know so much more so hopefully a lot of what you're sharing and talking about is is really going to start to become much more normal to know about and grow up especially as as girls to understand and then just know you know that this is how you take care of yourself this is how you create a healthy diet and also what contributes to to you know, having really strong health through more than just the food you eat, but certainly knowing that that huge role that food does play. And I think we need to be really respectful of food, actually. I, I feel like we, we're very much, certainly in, in Western societies, kind of, um, I don't know, a bit obnoxious towards food, you know, in that we can just have it, we can eat, buy it, mm. we can eat what we want. There's no repercussion, you know, and, and obviously some people now are much more concerned about, you know, the environment and ethical values and associated with food. But it's still, I think, more of a minority. Do you know what I mean? I just feel like we're a bit kind of like, you know, greedy almost and that we can have what we want and, and we don't think about you know, the the repercussions of that on our health, because for me, it's mm-hmm. certainly about our health span. You know, we all want to be here and live for as long as we can, but we all want that with good health because we want mobility and good cognitive function and, and we want to be enjoying those long years that we mm-hmm. have rather than spending yeah. many of them in Ill, Ill health. Definitely. And I think, you know, what the research is showing more and more is that you know, we've kind of reached our peak lifespans, but mm-hmm. we, for, for many, many people, are living a good 30 years of that in very poor health. And actually, with focusing on your nutrition and your lifestyle and taking care of yourself now, you very much have the potential to, you know, ex- ex- extend your life, no, you extend your health span um you know greatly so and like you say that that's such a massive proportion of your life and um you know having mobility and flexibility and strength and energy and all of those things are gonna mean that you get to enjoy your retirement enjoy that kind of final chapter of your life uh, as opposed to spending it you know, not really being able to go out or join join in with things, having to take loads of medications and all of that sort of thing. You know, it's mm. what you do now makes a massive, massive difference to that. 100%. And, and this is why we need to help women to shift away from just focusing on their weight and a diet and food being only related to achieving whatever goals they have with with their weight and diet and seeing that it's so much more you know we we live I think it's fair to say in fear of things like breast cancer we we don't know enough mainstream about heart disease which kills twice as many women as breast cancer does and then dementia and all of these things you know we don't want to experience those and as you said we can make choices that mean we're at a much lower risk of encountering one of those difficult illnesses or diseases which could impact our ability to have a healthy 
lifespan or to even have that long lifespan itself. So, yeah, maybe, you know, I, I really hope that we've kind of helped people to have that penny drop moment and think a bit differently about the approach to food and diet. And, you know, for, in terms of weight, <laughs> There is a factor in having a healthy weight in creating that health span as well as in the, you know, we, we've got to think about the weight that we are, not from an aesthetic point of view, but from a health point of view, because we know there are so many risks from, you know, being overweight or, or obese as well. So there is some reality there to, to it, but doing it for the right reasons as opposed to just trying to, what I talk about, like building your self-worth and happiness by hitting a certain weight goal, which which many women, unfortunately, are stuck with that belief of. Yeah, and I think a lot of women come into a diet or some sort of weight loss approach from a place of self-loathing and self-hate and really wanting to lose that weight because they think they're going to love themselves once they're, once they're slimmer. Um, but actually, unfortunately, for most women they don't love themselves more once they're slimmer for, you know, whatever reason often it's because, because they haven't got that self-worth there. They, they just see other flaws in themselves and then want to work on other things. Um, but actually if you can approach your weight loss or your dietary change or however you want to term it, if you can approach it from a place of self-love and, making those changes because you love yourself because you want to do the best for yourself and nurture your body then it's much more empowering it's much more rewarding um and I think it's it kind of you have a bit of a snowball effect when you do that um whereas when it comes from a a place of self-hate every time you fall off the wagon you hate yourself a little bit more and it, again that can be a snowball effect but in the wrong direction yeah absolutely brilliant advice well thank you so much Louise I've really enjoyed it it's such a fantastic topic and conversation for me personally I really enjoy exploring more about this but I know it will definitely help a lot of people so yeah tell people a little bit about where they can connect with you I know you have a fantastic podcast I've been looking through lots of the episodes and I've followed it so I'm definitely going to be listening to some of them because there's a lot <laughs> lot that I like I say I'm just personally interested in but it definitely helps to broaden my knowledge as well so I'll obviously pop everything in the show notes but just let everyone know where they can find out more yeah, so my podcast is called The Thriving Metabolism and you can find it on any podcast platform and you can also find out more about what I do by going to louisedigbynutrition.com and you can also find the podcast there. And I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and you can find me by searching at Louise Digby Nutrition. Brilliant. And I will just endorse Louise uh, from what I've seen and known and this is why I wanted to have you as a guest when you reached out was you know that you are very credible very reputable there are a lot of people out there who are helping women to lose weight who are not authentic and acting with integrity and I think you know Louise is, is someone who's coming from a place of you know science-backed research and, and an approach that is proven right now anyway from everything we know to be something that really does help with building overall strong health regardless of what kind of weight goal you have but if you are struggling with with weight and gut health then I would definitely suggest reaching out to Louise and she's also put forward a, a great offer um for her challenge with a 50% off code which I'll pop into the notes so that's amazing thank you so much for that and for your time and sharing all of your knowledge thank you Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely.